watch on YouTube for some reason. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. This is the last show of the year. I thank you so much for watching daily. And we wanted to really end the year with a very, very inspiring guest who has an amazing story. If you haven't heard of him, his name is Chris Wark and he wrote a book, best-selling book, by the way, named, called Chris Beat Cancer. And he's got a new book out. It's an, actually a daily, I would call it a daily devotional. It's called Beat Cancer Daily. It's a wonderful book. It's really inspiring and it's very unique because it has no page numbers. We're gonna find out more about Chris and his book. Welcome Chris to the show. Thanks for taking uh, this holiday to talk to people because I thought yeah. it would be you know, I just, cause you are, your story is so inspiring. You are so inspiring. You inspire me. I remember when I met you at the uh, vegan influencer retreat, you just, you just, the work you do in the world. And I, I know you do so much, you can talk about it in different countries. So I think you're just one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. And I really appreciate all you do getting people to eat plants. Well, thank you. Gosh, that just, you make me feel so good about myself. Thanks. <laughs> well, you, yeah, yeah. And, you, and you look fantastic and nobody would ever know what you've been through. Now, I know most of my audience is probably familiar with you, but it's possible with YouTube. This could be the first time somebody is hearing about you. So before we get into how you beat cancer daily, how did you beat it? I think it was 17 years ago. Yes, I just celebrated my 17 year cancer anniversary, uh, which was like a week and a half ago. And I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer at 26. That was December, 2003. And uh, yeah, big shock, of course, cancer is always uh, a shock at any age, but I was not expecting that. I'd had abdominal pain for the better part of a year and it would come and go. And I thought maybe I had an ulcer and was referred around to a few doctors. And then eventually a gastroenterologist said, well, let's do a colonoscopy, you know, and see see if we see anything. Lo and behold, there was a golf ball sized tumor in my colon, which if you'd asked me what a colon was uh, a month before that, I would have told you a punctuation mark. <laughs> but uh, yeah, apparently a colon, that's a part of your body, the large intestine. So uh, yeah, there was the tumor and they said, look, we, we've got to get you into surgery and get this thing out of you before it spreads and kills you. And that's what most cancer patients hear, right? As soon as there's a diagnosis, they're rushed into treatment before they have any chance, any opportunity to read and research, to understand their disease, to understand the causes of cancer and to understand what they can do to help themselves survive. And almost every cancer patient asks their doctor why did I get cancer? What, ca what causes cancer? How did this happen to me, right? And the answer that they routinely get is, well, we don't know, you know, it may be genetic, uh, it, it might be bad luck. And what that does is that actually puts that patient in a, in a position of powerlessness. It makes them a powerless victim because the doctors are saying, in, a, in effect, they're saying, there's nothing you did to contribute to your disease. Therefore, there's nothing you can do to help yourself. We are your only hope. You're, you have one option, and that is to show up for treatment or die. And uh, that's pretty scary. And fear is a huge component in the cancer treatment world. Most patients are rushed into treatment out of fear. They don't know what they're getting into. They're not full... The, the side effects of treatment, the long-term, short-term side effects, um, the likelihood that treatment will cure them, these things are not disclosed. I mean, the, the conversations that a cancer patient has with an oncologist, they're not very long conversations. I actually created a free downloadable guide. It's on my website called 20 Questions for Your Oncologist. And this is the best thing uh, for any patient or caregiver because it will arm you with the best questions to ask so that you can make the best decision for you or for your loved one. Because most of the time patients are not asking the right questions. They're just asking questions like, am I gonna lose my hair? You know, do I have to miss work? And, which is fine to ask those questions, but hey, the most important question you can ask is, will this treatment cure my cancer? Yes or no? You'd be shocked at how many patients don't ask that question. So I 
didn't know any of these things. I had no experience with cancer at all. Again, 26 years old, I was in the real estate business. I was a musician, uh, newly wed. Like my life was pretty good. I was really excited about just like the things I was doing as a young adult. And, um, but it got derailed pretty quickly. And so I, I had surgery on December 30th, uh, which yeah, it was yesterday, 17 years ago. Uh, and they took out the tumor, took out a, a third of my colon. When I woke up, they said, it's worse than we thought you were stage three C. We thought you were stage two because you're stage three, you're going to need nine to 12 months of chemo. And so, uh, you know, it just kind of went from bad to worse. Right. And if you're stage two, you can get surgery and go home and that's it. You know, typically there's nothing else to do, but once it's spread to your lymph nodes, uh, the likelihood of uh, recurrence and metastasis to the liver is very high or metastasis in other places. So um, I accepted the fact that I was probably going to have to do chemo. I was just like, okay, I guess this is my life now. But a couple things happened in the hospital that are, you know, part of my story and that I talk about in my first book, Chris Beat Cancer. And that was the first meal that they served me in the hospital. And everybody's heard jokes about hospital food, but I've never been in the hospital. Like I'd never eaten hospital food until I was in there. And the very first thing they gave me after cutting out a third of my large intestine was a sloppy Joe. Oh my God. Which I know you love sloppy Joes. <laughs> I know how much you love them. Everyone loves them, right? Uh, the sloppy Joe is such a funny like, food item because you can't get a sloppy joe anywhere, right? Restaurants don't serve sloppy joes because nobody likes them. The only place you can get a sloppy joe, as far as I know, is summer camp, the military, and prison. That's it. And then, oh, hospitals, if you're sick in the hospital, they're serving up a sloppy joe for you. And uh, they're still doing it. My dad was in the hospital in December and he got a sloppy Joe <laughs> one day. They're still giving sloppy Joes to sick people. It's insane. But anyway, so they gave me the sloppy Joe and I'm like, this is the worst food. I, I, why? Why are they serving this kind of stuff to sick people? The other thing that happened was the day my surgeon came in, uh, we were having a conversation. Sorry, the, the day they told me I could go home, my surgeon came to see me one last time and and I said, hey, is there any food I need to avoid? And he said, no, don't lift, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. And that was it. I mean, that was all the dietary advice I got from my abdominal surgeon. You know, I thought maybe he would have something to say about what I should eat or not eat. And so, you know, I started to get, you know, some clues that, and, and the wheels were turning. Why is healthcare so disconnected from healthy living? and health food and nutrition. I mean, I knew what health food looked like, fruits and vegetables. Um, I wasn't eating health food, <laughs> okay? Like I was a junk food connoisseur for, you know, from teenage years all the way up until 26 with cancer, you know? So now most people can eat junk food for a lot longer than that uh, before they develop diabetes or heart disease or cancer or one of the many chronic diseases that food causes, right? Uh, but it got me early. And um, so I go home, I'm recovering from surgery. And uh, I, you know, as I sobered up, I just started to think about my life and my future and what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. And I, I had this increasing resistance to chemotherapy. I just, I had seen cancer patients out in the world I'd seen what chemo, not cancer, but chemo had done to their bodies. And it was scary. And I thought, gosh, is that my future? Is that gonna be me? And I didn't want it to be me. And I just thought, I don't, I don't feel good about this. I don't think this is what I should be doing. My intuition, my instincts, my gut, whatever you wanna call it, was, was just putting up some red flags. So, um, I prayed about it. My wife and I prayed together and I was like, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me, Just show me what to do. I I'm help, right? Just a simple prayer of desperation. Uh, but also a prayer of faith because I, 
I, I believe that God works all things for the good of those who love him. That's from Romans 8, 28. You know, I believe that he does. He works things for our good. When bad things happen in life, that he turns them for the good. Not instantly, not the, an hour later or a day later, but we can look back at all kinds of adversities we've had and seeing the blessings that come out of those things. And so I chose to believe that, right? Just to exercise my faith and believe that he was going to work this terrible thing for my good somehow. Uh, but I was still very you know, struggling with fear and, and doubt and hoping I wasn't going to die young. So a couple days after I, I, you know, I asked for some help. I got a book that was sent to me from a man in Alaska who is a friend of my dad's. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. And he sent me a book by George Malcolmus. Did you ever have any run-ins with George? I, 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 in a Jeopardy game, a plant-based Jeopardy game, he was a clue. He was from Hallelujah Acres. Yeah. Yeah. So George was, uh, he basically had written a book called God's Way to Ultimate Health. And he had colon cancer in the 1970s and went all raw. And a year later, no tumor, didn't have surgery or chemo or radiation, like no, no conventional treatments. His body healed. And I, that to me was such an incredible story, right? And it just gave me enough spark to believe that, you know what, he's a human, I'm a human. If his body can heal colon cancer, maybe my body can heal colon cancer. So maybe I should do what he did. And so overnight, I, I adopted a raw food diet, just like that. Um, I didn't have a bunch of studies or research or testimonials or evidence. I didn't have anything. I had one man's story. That's all I had. But it was compelling. And in my core, I also knew it was not hard for me to believe that fruits and vegetables would be good for me. And I was actually excited at the prospect of overdosing, <laughs> as I call it, on fruits and vegetables. Like what would happen if all I ate was raw fruits and vegetables? This is such a new concept, right? Um, again, this is 2003. Okay. Nobody was talking about the raw food diet. It wasn't cool or hip. There was no social media. There were no raw food influencers, right? Taking beautiful pictures of themselves holding, you know, a watermelon on the beach in a bikini or whatever, right? This was a fringe weirdo diet for sick people. That's what the raw food diet was in 2003. And, uh, as I discovered, <laughs> okay, but I, you know, I just knew, I just knew it would help me. I just had no doubt, right? I, I was, I went from eating one to two servings of fruits and vegetables per day to eating between 15 and 20 servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. That's massive action. That's overdosing on nutrition, Okay. Was, and, and I just thought, you know, if I'm not going to do chemotherapy, I am going to try to kill myself with broccoli and let's <laughs> see what happens and carrot juice. Okay. Well, the carrot juice turned me orange, uh, right. You know, in, in short order, I was orange. People thought I was jaundice. Uh, there was definitely concern about my, but what was happening in my body because I did turn orange, but uh, just like a baby turns orange when you give it to a baby too many carrots or too much sweet potato. So uh, no harm done. But uh, I, you know, I, I made this choice to radically change my life in every way. And it started with the raw food diet. That was the first thing I did. And that really unlocked something in my mind that made me realize if I can do this, what else can I do? What else can I change? Right. How else can I help myself? And so it, it just began this systematic journey of total life transformation, which I talk about in Chris Beat Cancer, the book. And uh, I go down the rabbit hole of the cancer treatment industry and the pharmaceutical industry and, and all the perils and pitfalls uh, that patients really are not told that they need to know about it, uh, before they sign up for treatment. And um, in, that, in my first book, I just, you know, tell my story and talk about what I did, exactly the foods I ate and, and just how I, I systematically changed my life. You know, 
it's uh, it's so interesting that so many people like we have a doctor watching his name is Daryl Woodruff and his wife recently had surgery for lung cancer at, at USC which is a very famous cancer hospital and he said the first thing they brought her after the surgery they put her on a low carb diet that's what they gave her yeah for what I mean what yeah who's it, yeah, it's just it's just, it's amazing how there's such a disconnect. It, it, but were, you weren't were, you weren't necessarily eating any more horribly than anybody else uh, in America, right? I would say I was not eating any more horribly, but what I was eating was uh, processed food, junk food, and tons of meat and dairy. Okay, so the, the b- breakfast was cereal or some maybe some microwave sausage biscuits or some toaster strudels or or something, Uh, lunch, if I even ate breakfast, lunch was always fast food, right? Burger King, Wendy's, uh, Subway, uh, lots of barbecue sandwiches because I'm in Memphis, so there's barbecue joints all over the place. So a couple times a week, I'm eating barbecue, which is especially a toxic food. Um, uh, I... And, you know, it was like supersize me, right? I was getting the supersize Coke, Dr. Pepper, whatever, Mountain Dew, the, the large fries, the, the double cheeseburger. Like I've always been thin, so I can like cram in like a crazy junk food meal and not gain weight. Um, so, yeah. And then dinner was, uh, you know, maybe more fast food or maybe, uh, you know, like a Stouffer's lasagna or something microwaved. And my wife might, you know, at that time we were newly wed. So neither one of us were really into cooking. And, and so occasionally she might make like chicken breast and some, you know, a potato with it or something. Right. So that, yeah, I mean, that's the way I was eating. Uh, I wasn't smoking cigarettes or, you know, I wasn't really drinking uh, any alcohol to speak of, not enough to really make any difference, but yeah, eating the standard American diet for sure. And so really, you weren't really consuming any fiber. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say I was consuming any fiber. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't count the white bread, you know, that I was getting for breakfast, the white flour stuff for breakfast or the white bread kind of sandwich or, you know, sandwich bread, burger bun type. No, no, no good fiber. No, very little fruit, maybe a banana here and there, an apple here and there. It's just, you know, very little real food. And that's how... I would say most Americans eat. Yes, that's how most Americans eat. And you know, that food is, is food is the, the biggest contributor to disease. I mean, we've got 40% of the population now uh, are obese. Yeah. And it's gonna be 50 pretty soon. And I was surprised for, through with my work in, and you've been on, on my summit before, the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, how being overweight or obese is linked to so, like I think it's 13 different cancers. That's correct, that's right, obesity, the, the thing that, and we might've talked about this on your summit, I don't remember, but uh, the thing that one fact that I'm constantly repeating and, and trying to spread the word about is that uh, we know that cigarettes are the number one cause of cancer. Lung cancer is on the decline because so many people have quit smoking. That's great. Uh, but obesity is the second leading cause of cancer. 13 different cancers, at least. Because when you are obese, and this is not fat shaming, by the way. I mean, these are, these are just the facts, right? Uh, if, and the good news is if you're overweight, you can lose weight. You can lose the weight. If you decide to do it, you can do it. Uh, but uh, when, you're over, when you're overweight or obese, there's several things happening in the body. One is additional fat cells uh, produce estrogen. Estrogen fuels cancer growth. Uh, when you are overweight or obese, uh, your body becomes inflamed. So there are inflammatory molecules that are produced by fat cells. Inflammation produces an environment where cancer cells can thrive. The third thing is, and this was the most fascinating discovery for me personally about obesity. And I just learned this, I think it was in 2018 or 19 when I saw this research. When you're overweight, your immune cells are also overweight your immune cells take up excess fatty acids and they become bloated with fatty acids and your immune cells become slow and sluggish. And if you think of your immune system as an army, as many of us were taught, right? It's an army to fight off invaders and cancer cells. Well, what would you rather have? Do you want an army of like lean, strong, fast, 
soldiers or do you want an army that are, are heavy and slow and bloated? And that's what your immune system is like when you're obese. And guess what? This applies to not just cancer, viral infections, bacterial infections. Everybody's talking about COVID right now, of course. And the obese are in that demographic that are most vulnerable to COVID-19, right? Severe COVID-19 infection. Uh, there's that group, by the way, is so, the sodas, the soda club, S-O-D-A, seniors, obese, diabetics, African-American. Now there's another thread that connects all four of those groups and that's vitamin D status. So uh, seniors, obese, diabetics, and African-Americans all have, typically have very low insufficient or deficient vitamin D in their body. And so this is a very easy thing. And vitamin D is the number one anti-cancer vitamin as well. And so for cancer prevention, for uh, innate, to strengthen your innate immune system, to protect you against opportunistic infections like COVID-19, you got to get your vitamin D levels up. Sunshine's the best way, but most of us don't get sun, enough sun or don't live in sunny climates or don't go outside enough or it's winter. <laughs> so supplementing vitamin D3 is, is a, so easy, so inexpensive, something I do every day. And uh, I take at least 5,000 international units every day of vitamin D. Um, I made a, a video on my Facebook page about this the other day because there's a number of studies, over 70 studies have been published on vitamin D and COVID this year so far, um, specifically on the impact that vitamin D has on COVID uh, survival and prevention. So, you know, look, it's, it's amazing. Take it. It's so good for you. You know, uh, one, I think one of the first times I heard about you was when you had your Square One program and you offered it for free and you still do at, at once or at least or maybe several times a year. That was just, you know, I don't have cancer, but I watched every single episode. It was so well done and it, 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 there was so much value that you gave to people. It was just such an incredible program. Thank you so much. Yes, I did create a program called Square One and this was born out of one-on-one -on -one coaching with cancer patients because I started blogging, you know, uh, long story short, obviously I survived. And six and a half years after my diagnosis, July, 2010, I wrote my first blog post on crispycancer.com. And uh, so I just celebrated 10 years of being a blogger. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, the square one. So as soon as I started blogging, you know, people started reaching out to me, asking, can I talk to you? Can we, you know, I have questions. <laughs> can we get on the phone? Can we get on Skype or whatever? So I started coaching people one-on-one -on -one and uh, through that experience, doing that for many years, I realized I need to just take everything that I've learned, everything that I'm teaching somebody one-on-one -on -one and just put it in a course. And yeah, we put the square one program out online for free periodically every year. It is a paid program, so people can, can buy the program anytime, but we also do free screenings to make sure that anyone who wants to go through it can at no cost. So yeah, it's, it's so cool. I, I mean, it's so cool to know that you actually went through it and watched it. And um, yeah, it's, it's been, we have such an incredible private support group, private community of folks that have gone through the Square One program. And I just teach them how to, how to eat the most potent anti-cancer diet, how to change their life, their at, starts with your attitude, starts with the beat cancer mindset, which I, I really talk, the new book, that's really what it's all about. It's about the beat cancer mindset. It's about changing the way you think about yourself, the way you think about problems, um, and the understanding that your choices matter each day, right? Your daily choices are all adding up to a result, right, over time. And they're either leading you down the path of health or the path of disease. And so you can, you can radically transform your life just by making small shifts in the way you live your life each day. And so, yeah, the new book, Beat Cancer Daily, is, is a, it is a devotional. It's 365 days. And the, the subtitle is 365 Days of Inspiration, Encouragement, and Action Steps to Survive and Thrive. Well, what's kind of neat about the book is it has no pages. And so even though tomorrow or today would be a great day to start this, whatever day a person gets the book would be their day one. Yes, that's right. Each entry is, is uh, day one, day two, day three, right? But yeah, there's, uh, it's not time sensitive. It's not like January 1st or something. 
uh, because look, you know, cancer doesn't start on January 1st, right? <laughs> like you, if you get it when you get it. Um, and, uh, and so this, yeah, I just, I wrote this book because I, I wanted to be able to encourage and inspire and give practical, useful advice every day, because look, it's a daily journey, right? Healing is a daily journey. Weight loss is a daily journey. Uh, I mean, life is a daily journey. I, you can't live tomorrow. You can't live yesterday. Like you've got today to worry about. And so what, what can you do today to uh, improve your health? And th there's an entry in the book that uh, is called Live for Tomorrow. And the idea of that is we, our culture, and this is just human nature, by the way, but this live for today mentality, right, is pervasive in, in our culture, right? That it's like, oh, eat all the burgers you want, drink all the beer you want, you know, live it up, drug it up, smoke it up, right? Party it up. Who cares about tomorrow, right? Well, um, that's not a great strategy <laughs> for, for health and longevity, right? And so living for tomorrow means making choices today that are going to benefit you tomorrow. So I eat healthy today because I want to be healthy tomorrow, right? I save money today because I want to have money tomorrow. I exercise today because I want to be fit and strong tomorrow. And so like, it's not about depriving yourself, but it's just about having a long-term perspective and understanding that your choices today produce your future tomorrow. And if your life stinks today, right? If you, if you really are in a rut and you've got problems in your life, you can work your way out of those problems by changing the way you think and act each day, like starting today, starting tomorrow. You know, it's interesting that the, what you write about in this book and the things that you teach in the Square One program it's not only applicable to cancer because there were people watching like Peachy who said, I did the program three times. I've never had cancer. It can, it, it's just basically good life advice, but also for any chronic disease. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, the thing that I, I I'm trying to communicate to the world, <laughs> there's many lessons I've learned, but one of them is that yes, most chronic disease is caused by the same things, Right. A chronic disease manifests in different ways in different people, but the, the root causes are all the same, right? The root causes are eating an unhealthy diet, not exercising, uh, excessive stress in your life, which I love to talk about, um, negative emotions, and uh, unhealthy lifestyle habits. So all of those things will produce disease. Your disease might be cancer, but it could be heart disease. It could be diabetes. It could be MS. And so, yeah, the same thing you would do to get healthy, to help your body heal or prevent cancer. It's the same thing to prevent all the, all the other chronic diseases. They're all caused by the same stuff. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it is much bigger than cancer. And, you know, Beat Cancer is kind of my brand. And, but the, the new book, especially... I mean, really, both my books are, are not just for cancer patients. Like the reality is one out of every two men will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. One out of every three women. So if you don't have cancer, uh, you should be serious about prevention. You should take prevention seriously because the odds are not good, right? The odds are you're going to, you are probably going to get it if you're living and eating the way everybody else does. But if you change the way you're living and eating, then you can dramatically slash your risk. I mean, you can never be at risk zero, but you can drop your risk so far down. And that's really, you know, uh, there, we're surrounded by risk in the world, right? <laughs> you know, back to the COVID thing. Like everyone's afraid of their, you know, the risk, right? What's the risk you get COVID if you wear a mask or not, or if you don't social distance or whatever, right? Uh, or if you travel, like everyone's worried about risk. Well, the same applies to cancer. Your risk of getting cancer is much higher than your risk of getting COVID. And uh, these, are th these are risks you can mitigate with your daily choices. Yeah, you, 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 you know, it's funny. When you look in people's shopping carts at the grocery store, you would not think they know this. <laughs> They would not, they don't, right. And, and again, this conversation is a bigger, bigger than cancer because if you are 
your diet and lifestyle choices set you up for disease, right? They make you vulnerable to disease. They make you vulnerable to infectious disease. And so uh, one of the best things you can do, best ways to protect yourself from COVID, for example, aside from taking vitamin D, which is so incredible, is to get the excess weight off, right? When you eat a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, high in fiber, uh, with thousands of phytonutrients that nourish your body at every level, but naturally low in calories, you will lose excess weight. That's the beautiful thing about eating a plant-based diet. Or, and I'm not a raw foodist now, so I don't want to, anybody to think like, oh, I, I can never do all raw. You don't have to. Um, but a plant-based diet, whole food plant-based diet, or a raw food diet, uh, you can stuff yourself. Right. You, you, you don't ever have to be hungry. You don't have to manage your portions. You can eat as much fruits and vegetables as you want. <laughs> eat until you're full. Right. Three meals a day or with snacks. It's fine. Like and you will still lose weight. It's really wonderful. Right? It's, I think it's 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 just such a superior way to to lose weight and maintain a healthy weight than crash diets and all this sort of processed weight loss food that is a billion dollar industry, right? It's crazy. You know, I, I took a few notes with the book because there were certain days of the devotional that really spoke out to me. And one of the things you talked about in the book, which is really hard for me because what one of the things you suggest, obviously are the, the foods, the anti-cancer foods, especially the green vegetables, no problem doing that every day. The exercise, which has anti-cancer properties, no problem doing that. But then you start talking about forgiveness, how it's a courageous act. And Chris, I'm going to be honest, I struggle with that one. I, I, I think about this person who done me wrong 10 years ago, and I just can't seem to let it go. I'm so glad you brought that up. Forgiveness is like my favorite topic. <laughs> Yay, let's talk about forgiveness. Um, yes, forgiveness is a huge theme. Uh, in both books. And it's a recurring theme throughout the devotional, right? It's going to keep popping up throughout the whole year because, um, okay, let me frame it like this. Stress is the root cause of disease, of almost all disease. And here's why. Uh, and when I say stress, the term is a little bit nebulous, right? What is stress? Uh, well, we kind of know when we're stressed out. We kind of know when we feel stressed, right? But what stress really is, is it is a state of negative emotion, okay? Negative emotion, all right, what is negative emotion? Well, fear, worry, and anxiety, that's negative emotion. Uh, anger, hatred, bitterness, and resentment, those are negative emotions. Jealousy and envy, negative emotion, okay? Uh, shame and guilt, negative emotions. So, uh, all of those emotions produce a state of stress in your body. And many of us are, are bouncing back and forth between them, right? So we're thinking about the past and we're feeling uh, guilt and shame for mistakes we've made. Or we're thinking about the past and we're feeling bitterness and resentment towards people who've hurt us. And then we jump to the future and we're worried What's, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen to the economy? What about the election? What about COVID? So then fear and anxiety and worry, right, are, are in our mind. And then maybe we're back in the present and we're on Facebook or Instagram and we're seeing somebody else's life that seems so great and we're getting jealous and envious, right? And so this is the way a, a lot of us are just bouncing back and forth from living in the past, living in the future, and then even in the present, we're entertaining these negative, stressful emotions. Now, and then on top of all that, we actually have real problems in our life, right? Maybe financial problems, relationship problems, work problems. Those are creating stress and anxiety. So that's a lot, right? I just piled a whole lot of stress, right? Like on top of you, if you're thinking about, whoa, man, that's a lot of different sources of stress. Well, guess what? If you're living in a state of chronic stress, and not, and not realizing that you are, then what happens is that stress isn't just between your ears, okay? Negative thoughts and emotions translate to stress in your body. And when you're in a state of stress, your body starts producing more cortisol and adrenaline. 
And those two hormones are destructive. They will help save your life in an emergency, but they're destructive if they're elevated day in, day out over the long haul. So why are they destructive? Well, they two main, there's several factors, but one, cortisol and adrenaline suppress your immune system. They also promote inflammation. Cortisol also promotes weight gain, right? And so over time, if you have a chronically suppressed immune system, chronically inflamed, you're gaining weight, your body becomes a place where cancer can thrive. So what does this have to do with forgiveness? I'm getting there, <laughs> okay? But, but I, I have to lay the groundwork because all stress, right? All negative emotions produce stress. And so we, you have to kind of get a handle on, okay, where am I entertaining negative emotions, right? Some people don't worry at all. Like that's not their problem. That wasn't my problem. I'm not a worrier. But bitterness and resentments, and envy and jealousy and being competitive, that's where I was feeling a lot of stress, okay? That's, that's how I'm wired. Um, and so I had to first acknowledge like, okay, I'm doing this, right? I, I am letting myself entertain envious and jealous thoughts and resent people and be bitter and things like that. Uh, and I have to catch my thoughts and I have to interrupt them and choose not to think that way. We get in patterns of thought where we just become negative and critical and cynical and jaded. Like I was that guy. I was, a, I was a very critical, negative, you know, sort of arrogant and prideful and very insecure at the same time. Cause those are two sides of the same coin. The most prideful people are also usually the most insecure, the most critical people, right. Are very insecure. And I was that guy for sure before cancer. And so as I was reading and learning from natural healers and survivors, you know, everything I'm talking about, these little ideas would keep coming at me about uh, my thoughts and my emotions and bitterness and how they could be wrecking my health. And so unforgiveness uh, is, is the same thing as bitterness. Okay. Resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness. They're, they're all the same. So I made a decision that I'm going to forgive every person who's ever hurt me. Because in the throes of my cancer healing journey, the first two years, which were the most intense, I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Right? I, I like, okay, I can eat raw foods till I turn orange and take all the supplement, take supplements by the handful and go run miles every day. Right? I can do all this stuff. But, and I've seen this with other people too. If I don't address my inner thought life and my emotions, you may not get well. And I've seen this. People don't get well if they don't forgive. Like it, it can be the one barrier to healing. Dr. Kelly Turner, who wrote Radical Remission and Radical Hope, she, you know, she uh, studied a uh, thousand plus cancer patients and interviewed them and, and sort of distilled down the common factors that all survivors like me, I was actually uh, quoted in her first book, which is pretty cool, um, what we have in common. And she identified 10 factors that radical remission survivors have in common. And only three of those factors were physical, diet, exercise, and supplements. The other seven factors were all mental, emotional, spiritual, and social, okay? So just based on that real simple kind of rudimentary analysis, 70% of your health has nothing to do with your physical choices. So, and it, heck, it might be even more. So here's the forgiveness part. If you hold on to bitterness, right? You keep yourself in a state of stress. That's the deal. You keep yourself in stress and, and that stress will suppress your immune system. It promotes inflammation. And guess what stress does? It leads us to self-medicate. So I'm coming full circle here when I said stress is a root cause of most disease, because how do we medicate? When we're stressed, we're going to seek some type of medication. It's going to be food. It's going to be drugs and alcohol. It's going to be prescription drugs, illegal drugs. It's going to be uh, maybe pornography or sex addiction or gambling or, uh, you know, uh, home shopping network <laughs> or just Amazon. I was going to say, this is my new addiction. I found a 
fairly affordable top uh, clothing store. And I've been going a little bit crazy. Amazon. So uh, these are ways that we self-medicate, right? And most of those self-medication habits are uh, destructive over time, right? And uh, especially if you're spending too much money and running up a bunch of credit card debt, you know, um, but overeating, smoking, drinking, all that stuff. So that's how stress is the underlying cause of all these chronic diseases, right? Because stress leads us to make the unhealthy diet and lifestyle choices. So if you don't address the stress, it's really hard to stick with the healthy diet stuff, right? Because you're going to get drawn back to those foods that help you cope with stress, right? The ice cream and the pizza and the, you know, candy bars or whatever, right? The sugary, the sugar, the high calorie foods, right? Uh, dairy, especially cheese and stuff like that. Uh, so that's why crash diets don't work because anybody can do something hardcore for a short time and, and get through it. Anybody can do a crash diet for two weeks or a month or something, or even a few months. But if they don't deal with the stress, the reason that they're eating so poorly, they're going to go back to it. Okay. So all that said, forgiveness has to happen. You've got to do it. You have to forgive because it will just eat you away on the inside. It will slowly eat you up. It will make you more bitter, make you more unhappy. And so the way that I learned to forgive, which is, it's a very simple thing. It's just a decision that you make. Your feelings don't matter because forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a choice. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to choose to forgive everyone who's hurt me. So I, I got quiet and I sat down on multiple occasions and I would just think through my life. And I would just, uh, just go back, you know, sort of pull open the filing cabinet drawer in your mind where you keep all the painful memories. The memories of people who let you down, who... Uh, hurt your feelings, broke your heart, uh, cheated you, cheated on you, um, insulted you, betrayed your trust, or whatever, right? Abused you. All those memories are in their own little locked away cabinet, but you got to open the cabinet, you got to go through them, and one, one by one, as, as that memory comes back and that person comes to mind, in that moment, you can, you can just kind of grab a hold of it and say, you know what, God, you know what they did, and you know how I feel about it. I, I'm, it still hurts. I'm still upset. I, you know, I'm still angry. I still want, you know, justice for what they did to me. But I'm choosing to forgive them. I'm letting it go. I'm giving them to you. They're all yours. That's the way I do it. And I just, I just surrender it to God and just say they are all. You can deal with them. I'm not going to hold on to the pain or the anger anymore. Because when you're in a state of unforgiveness, you actually are keeping yourself in a prison of pain, right? A person can cause you pain, but you can keep yourself in it, right? Through bitterness. And, and forgiveness is the key. It's like reaching through the bars and, you know, letting yourself out <laughs> of the prison cell. And it is a beautiful, powerful thing that costs you nothing. And, you know, one comforting thing is that people get what they deserve, right? They will get it. You know, everybody knows what karma is. Uh, in Christianity, it's the principle of you reap what you sow. You plant seeds, you're going to get a harvest. You plant a bunch of seeds of bad behavior, you're going to reap a harvest of bad stuff in your life. Like it's going to come back on you much bigger than what you put out there. Right. Cause you know, one seed produces an entire tree of fruit, right? One seed doesn't produce one apple. <laughs> and so it, it works both ways. One good seed produces a harvest of goodness in your life. And one bad seed can produce a harvest of bad stuff. So bad consequences. So it's helpful to, to remind yourself that even if you don't see this person get what they deserve, they will, right? They will. Um, the other thing that I do is it sort of to, to really, you know, seal the deal is I ask God to bless the people who've hurt me. And so after I say, you know what, I forgive them. They're all yours. 
I'm not going to carry this anymore. I'm asking you to bless them. And guess what? God knows I don't want them to be blessed. He knows, <laughs> okay? Like, you don't have to be insincere, right? And, and don't feel like, oh, if I, if I pray that way, I, I'm being insincere because I don't really mean it. He knows you don't want them to be blessed, but you're also asking him to bless them anyway, aren't you? And that's, that is really the secret formula. Because when you say, God, you know what? I don't want you to bless them, but bless them anyway, right? I'm just asking you to, you know what I really want. I really want them to get, you know, bit by a pit bull, <laughs> right? Or worse. But um, that right there, when you do that, you just open up your heart and God comes in and heals it. That's how you heal your heart is through forgiveness. Um, bitterness will, will produce a sick heart over time. It will poison and pollute your heart and forgiveness heals it. And so I just want to encourage anybody listening, you know, to, to take time to think through your life and forgive every person who's hurt you. Like it's not worth holding on to. Don't wait until you feel like it because you may never feel like it. Don't wait until they're sorry because they may never be sorry. Forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. And, you know, Jesus said something that's pretty scary. He said, if you don't forgive on earth, your heavenly father won't forgive you. That's scary, right? Like, let's not take any chances here <laughs> with forgiveness, okay? Like, let's just go ahead and do it. Like, forgive the people who've hurt you. So I've seen this be absolutely transformative and healing in people's lives when they just made this simple decision to let go of the bitterness, right? I know that's what I have to do. And, and like, well, well, how do you know if you've completely forgiven? Will, that, will, you still, will you still have an emotional response to that person when they come in contact with you or you hear about them? Or how does that work? So forgiveness is just a decision, right? And I liken it to a healthy diet, okay? So if you eat healthy for one week and go back to junk food, does it help you? It doesn't. So just like a healthy diet, forgiveness is a decision that you have to stick with. So when you say, I forgive Max for stealing my lunch money, you've made the decision, you've given it to God. And then let's say a day later, or a week later, or a month later, uh, you see Max or you think about him and you feel a little bit of emotion. You just got to catch yourself right in the moment and say, yep, you know what? I forgave him. You know, I'm not going to entertain the emotion. I'm not going to run through the whole scenario again of everything that happened that he said, that I said, that I should have said, that he, blah, blah, right? Like you just, you just say, no, I forgave him. God bless him, right? And just, you know, repeat the prayer if you feel like it. But uh, you know you've done it because it's just a one-time decision, right? And yes, your heart, God will heal your heart. And your feelings will change. And, and over time, you'll realize there will be a moment. Sometimes it happens instantly when you pray this way. And other times it takes a little time. But eventually, you just don't have the pain anymore. Right? It just goes away. You're just like, you know what? God bless them. I don't know. You know, it's just not, it's not a problem for me anymore. And believe me, I, I've had some people say horrific things about me right? On the internet. Uh, I have, I was, I used to be in the real estate business and oh my gosh, I had people lie to me, steal from me, break into my houses, steal the appliances, like, you know, move out in the middle of the night, wreck my, I mean, cause me so much damage and frustration and anger, right? And, uh, and I just learned to forgive, Right. And I realized through that process, really that process and the cancer thing sort of at the same time, because I was like, man, I'm, I, I knew some guys that had been landlords and real estate guys for many decades. And some of them were very, very angry and bitter people. And I thought, I don't want to become that. How do I keep myself from becoming jaded and cynical and bitter and just this nasty old man? And that was forgiveness. And you know what I also I learned, and I talk about this in Beat Cancer Daily, is when people hurt you, 
when they do you wrong, they set you up for blessing. They set you up for blessing. And that is powerful because that changes the way you perceive the whole situation, you know, because you're like, you know what, that person totally wronged me, but you, but they set me up for blessing. There's a blessing coming. And then I can actually get excited about it. So I'm like, oh, good. Oh, goody. I, there's a, ble- there's a big, a bigger blessing coming than the harm that was done to me. It's, that is it's such coming. a great way to look at it. Were you always um, a person of faith or did the cancer diagnosis propel you into this way of thinking and being? I was, yeah. So I, I was raised in a Christian home, but I was pretty rebellious as a teenager and young adult. And I just wasn't, wasn't, in, you know, was not religious or really a person of faith at all. And then uh, as a young adult, I, once I got out of my own, I realized like I really do, you know, I really do have a heart for God. Like I really want a relationship with God. And, and I just kind of fell in love with Jesus uh, for real, instead of just like, oh, believing Bible stories or whatever. And, uh, but then the cancer thing really forced my faith to become real. You know, it was like, okay, do I believe this or not? If I really believe this, then I better, I better act on it, you know? And um, there's so much encouragement in scripture, especially for those who are sick. And Jesus was a healer. And so, yeah, I, I, um, I just really had to dig deep in, in, in my faith. And like I mentioned that verse earlier, the first verse I thought about was Romans 8, 28. We know that God works all things for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And so I'm like, okay, if this is true, if this is real, if I believe this, then, then God's going to work this for my good. And, and that's all that faith is, by the way, it's a choice like forgiveness. You're going to you either choose to believe or you don't. And so I was like, I am choosing to believe this is true that God will work this for my good. So yeah, it, it, I, I had to learn a lot of lessons quickly. (laughs) It's like when your feet, no, they say there's no atheists in the foxhole. You know what I mean? Or on the deathbed. Yeah. Or on the deathbed, right? When you're, when you're faced with life, with life threatening situation, whether it's illness or whatever. Yeah. It's just like, man, it's time to get real. And, um, uh, it was easy for me to believe. I'll just put it that way. It was easy. It was like, what's the alternative hopelessness, right? There's, you know, no, thanks. <laughs> so I've been posting the link for the book. If people want to check it out, Florence said yep. she just bought it. So thank you so much. And Baby Cakes, who's watching live, said, I got diagnosed with cancer in October. I need to do better in 2021. It is hard when you eat well, and despite that, you get cancer. It is benign, so it will not kill me, but it can grow. Any advice for Baby Cakes? Well, it's, um, I hope she'll read my book because it's full of very, very specific advice. Uh, much more than I can share in just a couple minutes. But um, I think when, I'll, 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 I'll put it this way. I don't want to insult anyone here. Everybody thinks they eat healthy, right? So I don't know what eating healthy really means because everybody thinks they eat healthy. As, as far as everyone I've ever met, <laughs> right? They all think they eat healthy. Um, but uh, a diet that's plant-based all fruits and vegetables, maybe even all raw, I think is the, is the best anti-cancer diet, at least in the short term. But the things that we're talking about right now, dealing, taking a hard look at your life and stresses in your life and removing as much stress as you can from your life. And it starts with your thoughts, but then also dealing with stressful people and situations and getting away from them uh, can be absolutely transformative. And so uh, the physical stuff, eating for tons of fruits and vegetables and exercising are key and even some supplementation too, but you've got to address the mental, emotional, and spirit, spiritual side of your health. So I know that's kind of vague, but I, this, these are the things that I go into great detail in both of my books. And um, that's what I would encourage baby cakes <laughs> to do. Is not to, eat, really, to not eat cake. <laughs> <laughs> don't eat the baby cakes, yeah, don't right. eat the little Debbies. Um, but uh, that's, that's usually the missing piece of the puzzle for folks, even if they really are eating what I would consider healthy and you would consider healthy and they, and they develop sickness. Usually it's because mentally, emotionally, spiritually, there's some, some real problems there uh, that they need to address. 
So I have to comment. I, I wrote a few things about, I mean, all the, the whole book was great, but there was one thing. It just cracked me up. On day 231, you talked about stay away from negative people, which I think is great advice. And then you write, they have a problem for every solution. That's yes. hilarious. Yeah, it's a great quote. I, I did not make it up. I, it's like an anonymous quote that I saw somewhere. But it's true. Negative people have a problem for every solution, right? They're just constantly fault finding and nitpicking and complaining. And it's contagious, right? It sucks your energy. It lowers your vibration. And uh, people like that, that, you need to be around people who build you up, right? Who are positive, who are encouraging, who support you. Uh, especially if you're sick, but if you just want to have a better quality of life in general, surround yourself with people that, you know, that are happy. <laughs> people that understand how to practice gratitude. Another big theme in the book is practicing gratitude. Um, yes. Uh, and, and a lot of us don't realize until you step back and go, wait a minute. Oh man. Yeah. I'm around a lot of negative people all the time. Like, and I don't have to be. So let me just slowly back away. <laughs> Sometimes you got to run away. Some people are saying, what if that negative, what if that person is your spouse? So I suggested a session with Dr. Lyle because. Counseling. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. There's, there's a lot of wonderful resources. And let me tell you, my absolute favorite resource for relationships is, uh, is a, an organization called Relationship Development. That's Stacy Martino and her husband, Paul. And I've interviewed Stacy on crispycancer.com, but they have, they have the, oh man, they just kick butt at transforming marriages and relationships, saving marriages. Like that is their mission. And, uh, and it's awesome because you don't have to have both. You don't even have to have both people involved. It just takes one person to go through their program to save a marriage. So that's a little, little teaser there. I'm supposed to be here promoting my book and here well, I am. Well, no, but, but that, that's, but, but see, you're, you're a very giving person like that. Cause the next thing I was going to ask you about the work you do outside of the United States and how we can support you in that. Well, um, are you talking about my charitable work? Yeah. Your charitable work. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Well, there is an organization called never thirst that has been very close to my heart for, I guess, six years now. And every year I, I do a fundraiser for Never Thirst. Uh, what they do is they go into to very poor countries like Cambodia and they uh, drill clean water wells. And a lot of folks have probably heard of charities like this. Um, but yeah, they, they just, it, there's a, just a really tremendous need. Millions and millions of people in the world don't have clean water. I mean, it's so hard to imagine as an American, right? I've never not have clean, had clean water, right? I just go and turn the faucet and then it comes out. But there are millions of people in the world that don't have running water. They have to go collect drinking water from ponds and you know, dirty water sources that are full of bac bacteria and parasites and viruses. And it causes uh, so much sickness and death in the world. And so it's, gosh, it's just such a, it, fundamental thing to life and health and survival is having clean water. And so, yeah, we've, uh, for six years, we've done fundraisers. And uh, this year we raised, oh gosh, I guess we raised 200 and over $200,000. Um, and uh, which was amazing. Last year we raised over $300,000. So we've raised a ton of money and, and provided, I have lost count now, but maybe 20,000 20, people with clean drinking water in Cambodia. So um, yeah, I, I just am so proud of uh, that organization and what we've been able to do. It just makes me so happy. And I've been to Cambodia a few times and uh, it's such a beautiful country. The people there are so absolutely wonderful. I mean, there's just the kindest, most peaceful, loving culture. It's just a really, and it's one of the poorest cultures in the whole world, one of the poorest countries in the world. So, uh, but you can look up Never Thirst and, uh, and see what they're about. And, and if you're uh, compelled to donate, please do. I mean, they're just, they're a worthy cause and they have a very, very small team and almost all the money goes straight to, you know, the mission of uh, delivering clean water sources. Uh, so there's not a whole lot, bunch of bloat and waste that you find in giant charities. So, yeah. 
Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you for that work. A lot of people are saying that because of you, they have the Berkey water filter. Me too, because that's what I heard about. It was on your Square One program. Yeah, the Berkey makes a great filter. Now, I have a video on my site, um, chrisbeatcancer.com forward slash Berkey, B-E-R-K-E-Y. Um, five reasons why I love the Berkey water filter. And I kind of, you know, take it apart and explain it and all that. But yeah, it's just great. It's a great water filter. It's portable. doesn't require any water pressure or electricity. They use it in relief efforts, uh, like uh, in, in areas where they don't have clean water. Yeah, such a cool water filter. It's just great. I've, we probably used it for mm, over a decade. It's great. Thank you. One of my other favorite days in the book was day 146, where you said, laugh it up. Laughter is free, immune boosting and health promoting. And that's why I, I do stand up comedy and improv. That's like my passion because it's laughing. It's just it's, like you say, it makes you feel so good and it doesn't cost anything. Laughter is amazing. And, you know, we've all heard laughter is the best medicine. I mean, that's an, that's an old anecdote. Um, but they've done studies and laughter boosts your natural killer cell, your immune cell function. It literally boosts your immune system, right? It's not just like a esoteric idea. It physically does this in your body. And, uh, and so, you know, one of the ways that we contribute to our own stress is watching too much negative media, the news, right? Uh, uh, reality TV where everybody's at each other's throats, competing with each other and being nasty. Even the primetime dramas, right? That's stress. Like when you're watching like a suspenseful show, I get that it's fun and entertaining, but it also, it's stressing you out, right? It is stressing your physical body. And so uh, for folks that have cancer, especially, we just encourage them, just watch comedy, right? Watch stand-up comedy, watch sitcoms, Watch anything that was, will bring you joy and laughter because it is doing more than just improving your mood. It is actually improving your immune function. And the benefits last for, uh, I think they measured, I, I'm misquoting one of the, my favorite studies on it, but I think they measured the benefits lasted up to 24 hours from watching one hour of stand up comedy. The immune boosting benefits lasted like 24 hours. Oh, that's Isn't fantastic. Cool? I, lo I love it. And I love to laugh and I love to make other people laugh. So I do thank too. I'm yeah. a goofball. Thank you. Maybe I'm, I'm sitting in the dark right now. No, you know, I, I was noticing <laughs> that since the show started, it's like, it's, it's like now you're just this image, you know, it's like this. Image. <laughs> I know. Like, yeah, it's not, I face a window in my office. I have a, a window behind my computer. And yeah, the light when we first started was wonderful. And then the sun went down. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it was like, I, know, I was going to say something. I was like going to really say dark. something, but I, I thought it was, like, it was kind of almost like a metaphor, you know, that yeah. you're helping, you're turning on the light for so many people. Yeah, I can brighten my monitor a little bit. Huh? <laughs> there you go. That's for, so guys, <laughs> please, please check. If you haven't read Chris's first book, Chris Beat Cancer, of course, read that as well. But this is, this is great because it's just a little bit, a little bit each day. You keep it by your bed. Oh yeah, show your, your first There's book. There's the first book, although the lights, it's hard to see it with the light, but yeah. First book's blue, second book's orange. Yep, they're, they're available in, in every major bookstore if you want to support. Here's a plug, you know, bookstores are struggling big time because of COVID, especially the small independent bookstores. So if you uh, want to get my book and you do have a favorite bookstore, you can call them up and, and they may have it in stock or they can order a copy for you. Um, if not, you can just get it on Amazon. You know, a couple clicks, get it that way. Both books, either book. Oh my God. This, okay, talk about, I don't know what the word is, divine intervention. I, I, I said I was going to end the show with just like opening the book at random and we were going to talk about that page. So okay. what do I open to? Forgiveness releases you from a prison of pain. There it is. <laughs> I guess that's that? what I need to be working on. <laughs> oh, I said it earlier. It really, really does. It really does. And I, uh, AJ, I love you so much. You're, you're the best. Oh, and thank you. You, you know, you really do inspire me when I met you, you know, you just do so much and you do give away so much for free and, and, and that, and you inspired me to do a program for free that we called 14 days to fabulous. It was a program that initially was going to be several hundred dollars. And when I left that conference, I said to my partner, I said, I just, I, I said, I met this guy and he's really inspirational. And I think we just got to give it, give it away, give it away. And it's just like you say, you get so much comes back to you when you do stuff for just because it's what you do. You know, I had mentors years ago that, that taught me this, uh, what, what they call the serve first mentality. And it just stuck with me, you know, serve first. And, I, and so as I started 
becoming a public figure and a cancer patient advocate uh, and wellness influencer or whatever, uh, whatever I am, um, you know, I just always felt better. Um, you know, it's like, just how can I serve people more? Right. How can I serve more? And I never thought like, Oh, how can I make more money? Right. It was just, how can I serve people more? And, and as long as my focus stayed on service, money came, you know, the money showed up. It was like, it, there was enough money to keep going. And, um, and so, yeah, it is, you know, it's just, there's no better way to make a living than serving other people. And there are some people in our space, won't name any names, but you can always tell within a few minutes of interacting with folks, whether their, their core driver is service or sales. You know what I mean? Some people are just there to sell you something and others are there to serve. And, uh, I've been around both and, and I'm just thankful to be, to have had have people in my life who really mentored me and in, into service because, um, I just think it's so much more fulfilling. I mean, it's just, yeah. you feel good when you serve people, you know? Well, you make a lot of people feel good. I'm so glad you have your health. You have a beautiful family and a beautiful life. And you're helping so many people in this country, in all countries with your wonderful work. So cancer for you really was a gift. And this book would be a great gift for anyone just to have by their bed and just read a little bit each night or when they wake up. That's right. Because beating cancer is not just about getting over a disease, right? Preventing it is beating it right? Prevention is beating it, considering the odds. So yeah, it's not, it is not just for cancer patients. And many of the entries uh, don't say anything about cancer, right? Many of the daily entries, it's not, they're not talking about cancer. We're talking about health and wellness, healing, gratitude, um, personal responsibility, forgiveness. That's a perfect way to end the year. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks, AJ. It's been great catching up with you again. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for the first two shows of the year at 9 a.m. We have Dr. John McDougall giving a brand new lecture he has never given before on protein. And at 1 p.m. we have a PCRM cooking instructor named Deirdre Dennis, who is going to be making oil-free Hop and John with cornbread croutons. Happy New Year, everyone. And thanks again, Chris. Happy New Year to you and your family. Bye. Happy New Year.